Hi all, Dr. Clark here again. And today we're going to take a look at Nideria. Okay? And we're going to look at two main life forms of Nidarians. Now again, not all groups, species of Nidarians have these two main life forms, but um, as a rule of thumb, Nidarians either come in or either have a life stage of being a polyp, which is kind of the asexual phase of the Nidarian, or the Medusa. And so right here, I have what some people call jellyfish um, in a dissecting tray. And this is the Medusa phase of many forms of Nidarians. And the Medusa phase is this sexual form. So they can either be male or female. They're going to produce you know, sperm, egg, eventually producing a zygote, etc. Okay, so we're going to look at the anatomy of these jellies, um, which are, like I said before, sometimes called moon or sometimes called jellyfish. Now, this is a group of jellies which belong to Scyphophosans, um, and this is a in the genera Arulia. These are moon jellies, or sometimes called moon jellies, or moon jellyfish. And um, they, they have some nice features that we're going to talk about and, and that we're going to go through today. So first of all, we're going to look at them because they are radial organisms. So they have radial symmetry. And these guys are actual, actually what we call tetraradial in that they have four... Um, features or four their morpho morphological features are in in fours so in other words they have four oral arms so you can see what I'm going to lift up with forceps here is an oral arm there and there there and there so they have four of them and those will be um, those will have tentacles Okay, and nematocysts, normally they'll have nematocysts associated with them. Um, we talked about that in lecture. Those are kind of stinging cells that allow for the organism to either have a defense mechanism or a feeding mechanism. Um, in the center of that, of the oral arms, is going to be the mouth of the organism, um, which would lead into the gastrovascular cavity or into the gastric pouches. And so these uh, kind of creamy colored regions, those are the gonads. Okay? And the reason why I say gonads, um, and on this one is kind of this brown region, and here, here are those um, tentacles, which are kind of easier to see on this darker uh, jelly than the other one. But the reason why I, I just label it gonads is because y these are either male or female but I don't know whether this is sperm or egg so we we'll just call it gonads and it's difficult to tell the other thing is is the reason why I just label this Arulia in the genera is it's also difficult to tell the species of moon jelly that you're dealing with um, normally that involves genetic analysis so for now Arulia is just fine that genera and we're just going to say that um, they're dioecious, but we don't know whether they're male or female. So these are the gonads. Inside, or that region in which you would find the gonads um, are going, is going to be the gastric pouch. Okay, so you'll see kind of a mesoglia, and that's the jelly-like substance in between the gonads. Okay. Um, other things that might be kind of difficult to see on camera, but there are these uh, lines or radial lines that are running down the organism, okay? And they form what we call radial canals. And radial canals help with um, allowing the organism to have a hydrostatic um, skeleton. So they take in water and they fill it and um, make it so that they have chambers in which they can fill 
with water to kind of have a skeleton system. Okay. On the outside, um, you can see another kind of a creamy color around the outside. And if you look close, and I'll try to zoom in on these, uh, those are the marginal tentacles. Okay. And so typically tentacles on the outside or on, on the umbla surface, so the ex umbla is the outside surface and the sub umbla is what we're looking at here, the inner surface. Um, if there's tentacles in those regions okay, and they're not associated with feeding, they're often associated with defense. Okay, so you might have tentacles that are associated with feedings on the oral arms and then tentacles that are associated with defense on the outer surface. Now, they can be used for both, um, but normally, kind of as a rule of thumb, that's how it works. Okay, So, again, um, they would have these marginal tentacles, which often will be also associated with nematocysts or have nematocysts attached to them, which would give them that ability to sting and um, for a defense mechanism or for feeding mechanism. Okay, so that's really the moon jelly. There's not a huge amount of uh, morphological features that I can show you, you know, and there's really no dissection. So there's no cutting on these guys. They're transparent. So when you examine these in lab, you're just going to examine them as a whole organism and pick out those features. Okay? Nonetheless, they're very important for the evolution of animals in the sense that, if you remember, Cnidarians have two tissue types, an ex external tissue type, which we call the ectodermis, and an internal tissue type, which we call the endodermis or the gastrodermis, okay? And nothing in between. Now, in between is mesoglea, but it is not a tissue type. Um, and so uh, they have two tissue tissue types uh, versus triple blastic, which we are with three tissue types, okay? All right, so... And the next organism I want to look at okay, is a sea anemone. Okay? And these are called plumous sea anemones. And mainly, um, again, the species, I don't, I don't know the species, but the genera is metatridium. Okay? Um, these are cold water, typically cold water um, anemones and, um, you know, probably made famous from Disney and clownfish and things like that is sea anemones. But, um, again, they're part of Nideria. And instead of being in the Medusa phase, they're in the pull-up phase. Okay, so they are stationary. So they would be the... the um, the petal disc would be down, and the tentacles would be up, and um, allow them to consume. Now, they're called plumous anemones because of the amount of ten tentacles that are around that central or oral disc. Okay, and so there's some, um, you know, features that I want you guys to know. The petal disc. Okay, or the basal disc of the organism, that's what's going to be attached to the surface. Um, and that's also what allows them to move. So sea anemones do have a nervous system, just like um, the medusa uh, jellies. Um, they do have a central nervous system which can coordinate movement, which is nice because these organisms can move around um, and, you know, sometimes escape predators that way. And I'll show you a different way that they escape predators or try to escape predators in a second. So again, the oral disc is this region here. Okay? This region here with this being the mouth of the organism um, and uh, leading into a pharynx, which I'll show you in a second. Now, there's lots of tentacles. Those tentacles... Uh, often will have nematocysts and have the ability to sting and um, uh, allow for them to capture food in that form. 
Okay. Now, I also want you to know that there are these specialized features called a conte. Um, a conte. So there's a little bit right there. Okay. And then I'll show you some on the inside. But a conte have multiple uh, different features or multiple different purposes, I guess. It depends on the species that you're talking about. A conte can be used in helping the organism stabilize itself on surfaces and probably, although maybe not confirmed yet, um, helps with movement because sometimes you'll see it on the petal disc. You'll see uh, some acante that is left over. But it also helps with defense mechanisms. And so the acante can also be released out either through the mouth or through the pores um, in, in the basal body. Um, and they can be expelled out with nemesis all over them and cause a stinging sensation. Um, and some species even have the capability of, to expel it and retract it, which is kind of neat. Okay? All right, so moving from the external features okay, to the internal features. So I'm going to kind of flip it around and show you from the mouth of the organism. Okay, which is here. So that's the mouth, and that would go into the pharynx. Now, I made a sagittal cut. Um, I didn't cut all the way through. I don't like to cut all the way through because you damage a lot of things. So I like to just open it and then kind of spread it open so you can see some of the unique features that um, these organisms have. Okay, so mouth into the pharynx. Okay, you can see the musculature that's occurring on the edges of the organism, those are the retractor muscles. This allows for it to you know, m move and, and um, even helps with digestion a little bit in, in that sense. Okay. You can also see gonads. So along these membranes, you can see uh, kind of a cream color uh, stacks. Um, that would occur along these membranes. Uh, those are gonads. Now again, this is a pull-up phase. They can reproduce asexually, but this sea anemones can also reproduce sexually. Now whether they're dioecious or monoecious depends on the species. Some sea anemones will be monoecious and some will be dioecious. So it really just depends on the organism. Um, whether or not they're reproducing asexually, depends typically on uh, the amount of food in the environment and things like that. Okay, so nonetheless, these are reproductive parts. These are the gonads, okay, and they'll flow down. They'll go around the gastrovascular cavity. Okay, so that pharynx that you can see here, you can see kind of striation there indicating that there's, you know, some kind of muscle and some digestion that's probably going on in there. And then that would enter the gastrovascular cavity, where is right down here. Now, sometimes you'll see food particles and leftover food in that region. Okay? But around the region, around the gastrovascular cavity, you're going to see reproductive parts. And so you can see some there and there, etc. Now, you can see these fine filaments here. And there and there and down there, one that goes across right here. That's a conte. Okay? So the organism has a conte in their gastrovascular cavity, which allows them to expel it in defense, but also push it out and to help with kind of binding to substrates. Okay? So there's kind of the anatomy of sea anemones. Um, now, depending on the species and depending on um, the, you know the size of the organism there are some other features that you'd be able to see but the sea anemones that we deal with those are the main features that I want you to be able to pick out um, during a dissection okay? alright so the next version we're going to move to the microscope and we're going to look at another pull-up phase um, which we call hydra and this is going to be a fresh water version and they're going to be alive and uh, I'm going to pull them up on the microscope so you can check those out okay, okay.
So under the microscope I have some hydra, okay? so these are called freshwater hydra or sometimes called green hydra. The computer screen is really not doing the color of the organism quite credit, but there are two hydra here and um, you can see a couple interesting features with the hydra and I'm going to point them out to you. So again, you can see tentacles, okay, and these tentacles would have nematocysts on them, uh, which they would use for feeding. You can see a region in which sometimes is called the mouth of the organism. Okay. Other times it's called the hypostoma or hypostoma, okay, and that's a region which they would feed and it would go into kind of a pharynx and into the gastrovascular cavity. And then you can see on this other individual, down here, this is called the basal disc or the basal body. Okay? And this is the region at which the organism would be attached to the substrate. Okay? Now freshwater hydra okay, are fairly common in uh, kind of tropical warmer waters and they feed heavily on things like uh, freshwater shrimp and freshwater fleas and and small micro microscopic insects um, and even protozoans and things like that when when you were looking at the water samples and looking at the protozoa lab they'd feed on things like paramecium and, and, and things like that okay but again this is a good example of a cnidarian uh, in the polyp form but one that occurs in a freshwater system. Right, so we can look, go back, look at those tentacles, and you can see them moving around. Okay? Now, I'm going to throw another slide on real quick so you can see a hydra going through the budding phase. So one of these looked like it was kind of swollen a little bit. Maybe, maybe this individual over here is swollen a little bit. Um, but they're not going through the reproductive phase, uh, at least, yeah, so neither one of these are going through the reproductive phase. But I'm going to throw a already prepared slide on so you can see a hydra going through the reproductive phase. So give me a second here to get it up. And so here you can see the tentacles. And then you can see down there the basal body or the basal disc. And then right in this region here, you can see a ex asexual or budding uh, example of a hydra. So this hydra is actually reproducing asexually and is budding off, okay, producing a new hydra, a, a genetic clone of itself. Okay. And so that's going to wrap up uh, the Nidarian examples, and uh, hopefully you get a little bit out of that, and um, you can examine these pieces and know the different physical features of the different members of Nidaria.